Thank you, Mario. How many of you learned the Peterson system of writing back in grade school? When you started in court and you slowly traced the flipping? Then you were being in train with something back then? All that over during lunch. John Keel, as we said, is a true Fordian treasure. Um, widely read, much admired author and grandfather of the current Fordian community. He's an assiduous worker, adventurer, writer, 13 books attest to that. What's your heart, John? I'm impressed, really, truly. Um, there's an anecdote from the wire services earlier this year that seems kind of a propos. Back in January of this year, a prime minister in India told a, government, uh, told a meeting of government employees in Bangalore that in contrast to his image of laziness, he in truth was actually a workaholic. He claimed that the various photographs of himself dozing off during official meetings are not in truth accurate. To quote him, most of the time, I am in deep thought about various welfare programs for people. <laughs> The point that's apropos is the statement about deep thought. And some of that perhaps is uh, undoubtedly occurred during his tenure as an editor for Playboy magazine. John has given deep thought to all many, many aspects of Fordiana. He certainly is a workaholic, as we said, his 13 books will attest to. And his workaholism has taken him around the world, as you're going to now see see quite literally. John's topic is around the world in 80 years, and you're going to see it in just 60 minutes. He's got some old film that's 8 millimeter, and there are probably some people who have no idea what 8 millimeter film looks like in this day of video technology. But John's dug it out of his archives, he's bought it to show us, we're particularly interested in what we're going to see about Egypt from the time that he was there and shot this in 8 millimeter tape. I hope you enjoy his presentation, we're certainly looking forward to it. John, the lectern is yours. Please welcome him.
and uh, it was in the old Wanamaker building, which was a department store. And the, in the basement of the department store, they set up a, a very primitive television station. And everybody there in, in the station worked for nothing and very close to it, because television was very primitive and only a handful of people had TV sets. Well, I used to hang around there and I was working on a newspaper and I, I would hang around there in my spare time and watch how everything was going. And they finally started paying me $4 a week. So that, that was a big, big salary in television. So I, I really was a pioneer in television. It means that I started too early and missed all the big bucks. Uh, when, in the early days of television, they would point it when they had uh, nothing to put on. They'd point the camera to the clock, and people at home would sit and look at this clock, with their hands going around on the clock. And sometimes it would be an hour and a half of just a clock. And the, one of the big hit shows of the '40s, the late '40s, was they pointed the camera. They had a camera up on Fifth Avenue on 42nd Street, and at five o'clock, when the, everybody was getting out of their office. The streets would be teeming with people. They pointed the camera out the window on Fifth Avenue and photographed all these people. And a uh, radio announcer named Tony Wands read poetry. This was a half hour show. And people were absolutely fascinated with watching all these people scrambling across Fifth Avenue. Well, I, I got a start in television. Of course, I was doing all kinds of other things, writing for magazines, writing for comic books. I met Jerry Siegel, who was the creator of Superman, and he saw me as a kid. He saw me himself, I guess, and he helped me a great deal in those years. And he was putting out his own comic books, and he had terrible ideas. Uh, one, one of his comic books was a, about a bubble dancer with a heart of gold. Now, a bubble dancer was like a fan dancer. She would come out on stage naked, and she had this big balloon or whatever in front of her and would dance around. And that was one of his comic books. And, uh, and uh, also there was a law in those days that all, all comic books had to have a short story in the center of them. And I found out I was very good at writing these little short stories. I got $25 a piece for it. And uh, so I wrote a lot of these uh, dumb stories. And uh, one of our well-known ufologists is long gone now, Otto Bender, also wrote a lot of those stories. Then the Korean War started, and here we, we, were, we all knew that television was going to be really big. But the Korean War started, and you know, my natural patriotic instinct was to defend my country and become a big war hero. In other words, they caught me trying to cross the Canadian border, <laughs> and they dragged me into the army, which was no fun at all. And. Uh, they were really very desperate. In the same group that I was in, went into the army. There was one, a man with one eye, and there was another man with a hernia so bad he couldn't walk. And they took him anyway. So I figured, Jesus, I'm, I'm in big trouble here. And uh, we went, uh, we took our basic training in Pennsylvania. Basic training was a lot of fun. They never let you sleep. They feed you rotten food. Uh, it was great fun, and every 10 minutes, your sergeant was telling you, now this terrain is just like Korea. And uh, we didn't like that very much. We none of us wanted to go to Korea. But when the training was over, uh, they shipped all the black guys to Korea, and they shipped all the white guys to Europe. And Europe was a pretty good place to go. But I was, at that time, I was incensed over this, but there was nobody to be uh, complained to. In the, in the army, uh, you, know, you complain and they're subject to Korea. <laughs> Which I did not want to go there. Now, in basic training, I met a young man named George who had worked on a newspaper in New Jersey. And we became close friends and we went to Europe together. And while we, we went on a troop ship, now talk about fun, there were 5,000 guys on this ship, and we'd, we'd line, stand in line for breakfast, and as soon as we had breakfast, we'd stand in line for lunch. <laughs> and 
<laughs> Thank God nobody was torp torpedoing what? Tor torpedoing your neck. <laughs> torpedoing, hey, can not say that word. Uh, anyway, nobody was out there trying to sink ships. It was, uh, it was pretty, pretty awful to be on a, a troop ship that got torpedoed because you wouldn't have a chance. Uh, we were crammed into the, uh, you know, into the hold like sardines. While we were crossing the ocean, and of course it was at a time when the Atlantic was especially nasty, so everybody was seasick. Uh, the the uh, officers and the sergeants and so on kept telling us that there were nothing but, uh, in a, the Americans were all in little tense cities all over Europe at that time. This is in the early 50s, right after the Second World War. And they scared us, they said, uh, the, the trains were like cattle cars and so on. So when we got off the ship, we were amazed to find that the trains were very modern. We landed in from Germany, Bremerhaven. And uh, we got our orders, which is a sheet of paper with nothing but gobbledygook uh, on it. Uh, unless you know what all these uh, phrases and initials mean, you don't know where you're going and how you're going to get there, and what they're going to do to you when you do get there. So our orders said uh, we were going to the 7707 AFN company, and nobody knew what the hell that was. So I all figured out oh, I'm going to be doing autopsies. <laughs> <laughs> so the train arrived in Frankfurt, and it was, it was a troop train. It was a very nice train, not a cattle car at all. We arrived in Frankfurt and all these soldiers got off the train and there were fleets of trucks waiting for them. And they all climbed into the backs of the trucks. And we couldn't find our truck. We, George and I were running around saying, where the hell is the AFN company? And a limousine pulled up. <laughs> Honest to God, a limousine pulled up and a German driver got out. And the Germans in those days, they probably still do, they loved uniforms. This guy was wearing uh, big boots and a big leather coat and he said uh, you know is this hair keel and I said yeah and uh, he, he'd come for us so we got into the limousine all these other soldiers that we ridden on the train with they were pretty disgusted <laughs> so we, we got into the limousine and we started off going outside of Frankfurt and we asked the driver uh, are we going to live in a tent? He said, no, you live in a castle. <laughs> he, he pulled into a, a town called Hurst. There was a bloody castle. And it was the Von Brunnen Castle. Now, we had a system in those days, and the Army had a system, where, you know, Germany was absolutely leveled, but anything that was standing, the, army, the U.S. Army took it. And they, they seized this castle and turned it into a radio station. That was what AFN stood for, was the American Forces Network. And we were suddenly, uh, you know, our, our basic training had been a terrible nightmare. And now we were suddenly living in luxury. And, and we, had a, we had a maid who came in and made our beds and <laughs> swept the floors and everything. And we had our cooks in the Army mess hall there didn't serve Army food. They traded it on the German black market for steaks and things. So we were, and they were very good cooks. They were carefully selected cooks. So George, George was assigned to the newsroom of the radio station. By the way, this is probably the biggest radio network in the world at that time. And I was assigned to production. And I was to produce radio shows. I knew a little bit about television, but I didn't know much about radio. So naturally, they made me a big shot there. <laughs> uh, now, in 1951, I was doing a, a lot of shows. That, uh, for example, we had a show called uh, something like a Profile of a Leader. And we were supposed to do a program every week about one of the generals living in Europe. And so they had the dullest biographies. You know, they went to this school and that school. And uh, a few of them had invented an actual battle. And after a while, we got pretty fed up with these 
dull biography, so we started inventing generals. <laughs> and, uh, nobody ever caught on to it. And oh, then from then on, every week you heard machine guns going, and the, the general saved his whole command. <laughs> and nobody ever questioned it. I, uh, and, the, and this station was heard all over Europe, and in, including England. <laughs> And that was just one of the. I also I I invented a, uh, a performer. You know, we got a lot of performers from the states who came over to entertain the troops, and we invented a performer and had an announcer act him out uh, who hated the army, hated Europe, and said all kinds of rotten things. <laughs> and uh, in every interview, uh, his name was uh, Gibson. I forget the first name we had for him. And uh, that was, and nobody ever caught us at that. So I was beginning to feel pretty cocky with it. Nobody at the, uh, in the higher level at the station was listening to us, I guess. And then Halloween came around. Uh-oh. <laughs> and, and believe it or not, there really is a real Frankenstein's castle. Now, I couldn't pass that. So I, I devised a program take place in Frankenstein Castle. And I did it in the, pretty much the same way that Orson Welles did the War of the Worlds. He made it like a real documentary that the uh, announcers and actors were really in the castle and they were trapped. And we, we went up to the castle to use the acoustics there. The, the story, by the way, of the Frankenstein Castle is that the, uh, during the Middle Ages, there was some kind of a monster crawling around the, uh, the woodside around the castle and uh, chasing people. And it probably was a wild boar, but I would hope there would be a Sasquatch or something. And the Baron of Frankenstein went out with his sword and he killed this monster. And uh, he, he, by the way, he was a, a little short fat guy with a bald head. That was the Baron of Frankenstein because they put up a statue to him afterwards. <laughs> And somewhere in, I have a photograph of me next to that statue. And the, the Frankenstein program that I did, it was an hour-long program, was heard all over Europe. And it was so realistic that the MPs listening to it down in Germany raced to the top of the uh, mountain to the castle. And they didn't, they didn't find any monster. They didn't find any uh, uh, dying uh, radio announcers or anything. And it was a big success. And there was a newspaper, there still is, I guess, called Stars and Stripes. And uh, everybody read that. It was a pretty good newspaper. And uh, so they, they did a big write-up of that. And they compared me to Orson Welles. And all of a sudden, I'm a real big shot in this radio station. I'm 21 years old, for God's sake. What room? So, <laughs> private. <laughs> All, all, of, all of the promotions at that time were going to the fellows in the Korean War on the other side of the world. And they, they weren't promoting anybody in the, uh, in, Europe, in the European theater. There was a freeze on promotions. Well, the next year, Halloween came around again. And I said, what the hell am I going to do to top the Frankenstein Castle story? And then I said, I know. I'll fly a team to to Egypt, and we'll do a program from inside the Great Pyramid. Now, in order to take a, uh, go through an undertaking like that, you had to get the approval of the colonel who was running the whole thing. And so I, I typed up a one-page outline of what I was going to do in Egypt, and he approved it. <laughs> and so we all uh, climbed into it. At that time, they were, the Army had its own airline called MATS, Military Air Transport. That. And uh, we all traveled to Egypt. And once we got there, I said, my God, I don't know anything about the pyramid. What am I going to do? <laughs> and I, I, went, I rushed around. I got books in Egypt, uh, any books I could find. To, and I learned overnight what the, what the pyramids were all about, what we thought they were about. And then I sat up all night and wrote an hour-long script. And the next day, we went to the pyramids. And we went inside the Great Pyramid. At that time, there were no tourists. There was nobody there. 
we had the pyramids to ourselves. There were no fences. Uh, there, there was a, a Coca-Cola stand in front of the Sphinx. And, and a little small Coca-Cola stand, and that was it. Uh, all you could get was a Coca-Cola there. So we did this uh, hour-long broadcast inside the pyramid using all these wonderful acoustics. You know, yeah, there were echoes, and it was great fun. Then we got on our plane, our mass plane, and flew back to Europe. And on the way, when we were somewhere over Greece, we had a terrible lightning storm. Now, if you've ever been in an airplane with lightning storms, it's pretty scary. And our, our show that we had taken in the pyramids was on tape. And when we got to Frankfurt, the tapes were ruined from this lightning. And, and now, I was I scared there couldn't tell the colonel this. So we, we went into the studios late at night and we redid the whole show in the studios there uh, using echo chambers and things. And, and it was a pretty big success, our, our pyramid show. People didn't know that uh, we'd gone there, made a show, and came back and made another show. <laughs> very dry. No, it's not. <laughs> this is only the start of my trouble. <laughs> when my two years in the army was up, I I had a big debate with myself. By by this time, I had a German girlfriend. Incidentally, because of the war, most of the young men our ages had been killed. German men had been killed in the war, and so there were like. 35 or 40 girls our age to every uh, German man. So the, the German girls had a problem. Mm -hmm. well, we didn't. <laughs> and I started dating a girl who was the daughter of a judge in Hamburg. And of course, nobody in Germany at that time had been a Nazi. But, but you, couldn't, you couldn't be a judge in Germany during the war years unless you were a Nazi. So uh, I decided to take my discharge in Europe, and they offered me a civilian job with the radio station. Now I was really a big shot. I was a suit. And, and so I got out of the army in Frankfurt, and uh, I had uh, suits made by a German tailor. From then on, I was, everything was tailor-made. And I got, at that time in the United States, people were earning something like $40, $50 a week. And there I was getting $200 a week. Wow. And yeah, yeah it was quite a difference. And uh, I, w I was gaining power all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, they couldn't do without me. <laughs> But after a year of that, I, now I had been in Germany three years, and Germany was then a very uh, grim place. As I said, most of the cities were in ruins, and the weather was terrible. It, it was, my memory of it is it rained for three years. <laughs> and there must have been sunny days, but all I remember, you're nodding your head, you've been there. Yes, Berlin. Berlin, yeah. You always, in the spy pictures, you always see the streets as wet. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, we had a station in Berlin, as you know, and I, I, went, I went to Berlin several times. And uh, the, the Berlin, because it was, at that time, it was cut off from the rest of the world. And the Berliners are different from the rest of the Germans. They have a sense of humor, for one thing. Uh, most, most Germans don't seem to. And we, we would, uh, from people from AFN, myself, uh, we would go into nightclubs there, and they turned the spotlight on our table because we were big celebrities because we worked at the radio station that everybody listened to. So that, that was great fun. And then, uh, oh, I did all kinds of strange things. I, I went around uh, all of France uh, producing a soldier singing contest uh, to help the morale of soldiers. Every, every unit tried to find somebody who could sing. And then uh, they had a, a sing-off. And then I arrived in my limousine, of course, and, and would uh, tape their, uh, their singing. So I, I covered all of France. 
Now, I've been in Germany, as I say, for three years, and I was getting pretty sick of it. And I decided, and this you can only do this when you're 22 years old and make this kind of stupid decision. I decided to quit. And I said, I'm going back to Europe, to Egypt. Because when I was in Egypt, I felt this strange kinship. That most, most people feel this when they go to Egypt. They, they feel that they're, we have a link with ancient Egypt, not with modern Egyptians. Are but first, uh, but the, the, uh, it's, it's a curious thing, and those of you who have probably been there, you know the feeling. It's just very odd. And so I went back, and uh, I, uh, I had all the press credentials in the world, and I interviewed uh, Gamal Nasser like four times. He was then president of Egypt. And I went to many of the pyramids. I got lost in the desert and all. And of course, I didn't have much money. And I had an agent in New York who was supposed to uh, sell my stories. But the problem was, he sold everything I wrote, but it would take a year to get the damn money. So there were many times when I was broke, but I had all these press credentials. So uh, when, I, when money was getting thin, I would go, uh, say, to uh, the Aswan Dam or Luxor, and I'd check into the most expensive hotel. And because I had, had official Egyptian press cards, they would tear up the check when I left. And I rode on all the trains and things for free because I had these press cards. So I was turning into an expert freeloader. <laughs> that, that was the secret because in those days, the dollar was king. Uh, if, if you were an American, they automatically assumed you were rich. And I'm, I'm wearing tailor-made clothes for guys. So they thought, boy, this guy must be loaded. And, and I was writing desperately to my agent, hey, send 10 bucks, quick. <laughs> um, my throat is so dry. Uh, we, we've done practically a half an hour here, and we got to show this film, because that's what you came to see. When I, when, I, when I was traveling, I traveled around the world with no money. If you tried it today, you'd probably get killed on the second day, because they want your wristwatch or your shoes. But in those days, uh, it was very safe, relatively safe anyway. And I, uh, I traveled through the Arab countries. I landed in Baghdad with not a cent. And I checked into a good hotel and sat there for several weeks till some money came through. And they, they extended me all kinds of credit because I was an American. They, they assumed that I was a, you know, a, a, a tractor authority or oh, an oil well man or something. <laughs> now, I started out with excellent camera equipment. I had a 16 millimeter camera that was sort of a state-of-the-art camera. But then, as I hit hard times in different countries, I started selling my equipment. And I sold my 16 millimeter camera for peanuts, uh, literally for peanuts, to get something to eat. And then later when checks would come in, then I would buy another camera. But I was always going downhill because the cameras that were available in those countries in those days were not very good. And in this film you're going to see, there's like, Ten different cameras were used to make this, and including a 16 millimeter camera. There, some of the Egyptian stuff was shot in 16 millimeter, and then later I had it reduced to 8 millimeter. Uh, and uh, I have also put in on this film. I bought a reel of film about Cairo, and I patched that into it. And so this thing is a, a, a mishmash of uh, various cameras and various films. My main interest in those days was magic, because I've been interested in magic since I was a kid. And so I was interested in what they called the Gali Gali men in Egypt. They were the street magicians. And I was also very interested in the snake charmers, and they had a lot of snake charmers in Egypt. And you'll see some of them on this film. There are also a lot of things that I filmed that aren't on this, because I lost the film. You can imagine in 40-some years, 
the films have gone through a lot. Some of the films are just lost. Others, when they were developed, they proved to be, you know, they were ruined. They were not really showable. And uh, you'll see uh, some of the uh, street magicians, and you're not going to see some of the people that I saw in India. Uh, for example, there were uh, groups of people who, because of their religion, they'd walk up and down the street, beating themselves on the back with a whip. And I tried to film that, and that film, God knows where that is. Uh, also, there were many strange uh, sadhus, as they were called, uh, holy men, who, who did outrageous things to make a buck or make a rupee or whatever. Uh, you remember Robert Ripley. He, uh, he toured uh, India several times, and they loved him there. He must have been a big tipper. So the newspapers always compared me with Robert Ripley. First in Europe, I was compared to Orson Welles, and now I'm Robert Ripley. And so they, they all thought I was a big tipper. Boy, were they disappointed. <laughs> but you would have, uh, along the Ganges, you would have uh, men standing on one leg for 30 years. They would, they would set up a rig like a swing, and they'd bend one leg like this, and they'd stand there for 30 years, and they had their little cup out in front of them, and people would throw them back sheets. Uh, it, was, it was not a pretty picture, but that was their career, standing on one leg. And so there, there are some pictures of some of these people and what they were doing that. There was one, uh, I, I don't know, I'll have to find a way to put it delicately. Uh, there was one man there who had a big bag of rocks, and he would tie this to his penis and pick up this bag of rocks with his penis. <laughs> and he was very well endowed, I have to say that. <laughs> and that was his act, and they wait until the tourists saw gathered there, go into his act. And uh, on this film, there's also uh, a, a fellow doing that with his eyeballs. I also, speaking of eyeballs, there was a man in India who had, uh, worked on his one eyeball and gradually loosened it until he pulled it out and it was hanging down on his cheek with the, the nerves and everything showing. And he, of course he couldn't see out of that eye, but that was his gimmick for getting out of hours. So we, we're going to run out of time here. Well, uh, this movie is about 20 minutes long. It's very old and it's full of splices. And let's hope that it doesn't break anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably explaining what's coming. Uh, or I'm just, I had a sound camera, the first one ever made, Fairchild. And I, I probably used the whole damn real film in it. <laughs> Smoking their version of pop. It's called uh, Hobbly Bobbly. <laughs> and 
and they drink, they drink, uh, they drink Arab coffee, which you can stand a spoon up in. I haven't seen this for a long time. The colors are completely gone. This is the Nile River. That's a bird, say a toy bird. 
charge of the empty basket.
going out into the desert <laughs> to find snakes. You know, snakes leave a trail that you can follow. Is it learning he's got one? This man, I think, also uh, put live scorpions on his face. Oh, this is a snake charmer trick. If they think they've got a, a, a wealthy tourist and watching them, they let the snake bite them. And then the tourist feels sorry for them and gives them big bucks. I said, gee, that doesn't look quite much of a wound to me. <laughs> I got a toenail in worse shape than that. <laughs> I, I have such a blabber mouth there. Let's see. Oh, this is the man with scorpions on his face. I sold these pictures. You know, in those days there were a lot of men's magazines. And they gobbled these pictures up. And this is part of the same sequence going out in the desert. And the trail on the way. <laughs> now the, the desert seems like a barren place, but it really is very full of life. Underneath the sand there are all kinds of strange insects and snakes and Okay. 
I, I did that with the flute. The, the cobra, you, you shake the flute and the cobra is trying to strike at the flute. Cobras can't hear. Snakes can't hear. So that, that's all showmanship when you see a snake trying to do that. Back to New York, I had three cobras and a boa constrictor with me. <laughs> and a publisher of the book moved me into a uh, pet store in the window of a pet store in Times Square. And every day at three o'clock, I'd get in the window and charm the snake. <laughs> but then you knew the four books, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> Time, but what about Lita? Historian, so uh, <laughs> Lita and I were together for seven years, and finally, uh, you know, I kept going away, traveling, and finally, uh, I came back to New York and brought her over a few months later, and we did nothing but, but fight when we were in New York, and the seven-year relationship just fell apart. You watched Casablanca last night; yeah. it reminds me a lot. <laughs> Lena and I have Cairo. <laughs> Who wants it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Now you have some idea why John is a treasured Fortean resource. It's just it's interesting, even though that footage was obviously very old, how little has changed over there in the intervening decades. We've been seen that two years ago on a trip to Egypt, and we probably see it today.